Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, the new book that's coming out in June, as Claire said. Um, so it's all about TEFL tourism. I recent, well, a couple of years ago now actually, I finished my PhD research on TEFL tourism. Um, I've also worked as a TEFL teacher myself and I know lots of people who have. Um, so that really um, sparked my motivation to write the book. Um, just to give you a bit of a background as to how it came about and why I, I think it's so important and why I think that it, it will um, have some increased traction in the academ academic community, um, but also in industry as well. Um, I was a qualified teacher. I'd done a PGCE here in the UK. And I went out to Thailand to be a TEFL teacher. I wanted to do a bit of traveling. I also enjoyed teaching. So I went out there and I did a, a TEFL, so teaching English as a foreign language course. It was a short course. Um, most of it was online, which was something that's new to me. Um, having done a PGCE, I don't know how familiar you all are with PGCE play, uh, placements and how they, they work. Um, they can be quite intensive, not necessarily difficult, but there is a lot of theory, a lot of teaching pedagogy involved. Um, and in the UK and certainly across uh, many Western countries, teaching involves a lot of, um, there's a lot of theory that underpins it. You know, how do you structure your lesson, having starter activities, plenaries, having differentiation, suiting the needs of different types of learners, um, you know, printing on different colours because perhaps you've got somebody who's dyslexic and all these sorts of things. You've got all of this stuff going on in the back of your mind when you're planning a lesson as a teacher, all of which you learn as part of your PGCE. So I'd been a practising teacher for two years, I had my PGCE, decided to have a change, went out to Thailand. There were many people who were actually doing it the other way round, who I was training with. So the TEFL qualification was um, about 20 hours online, the one that I did, and then it was one week practice in the destination, where you had people who weren't qualified teachers, apart from having the same TEFL certificate as myself, once I'd finished, who were training you. And you had about two hours practical um, practice in the destination. Now all TEFL do, uh, qualifications do differ, but this is just to give you an example. Most of the people in my course wanted to be teachers, but they wanted, or they thought they did. They wanted to get a taster. What's it like to teach? I'm gonna to go to Thailand and I'm going to test it out, see if it's for me. Um, I, some of them had struggled to get on a PGCE placement. So at that time, it was very difficult to get on a PGCE course. Teaching was really popular. It was just before they put the fees up. Um, so lots of people were enrolling on PGC courses and some people couldn't get on because they didn't have um, you know, the, the right experience on their CVs, etc. So they were doing it to gain experience to, to get a, on a PGC when they come back. Some people wanted to build their CVs to help get a job when they came back. Um, but what I noticed was actually, as a qualified teacher, to me, this, this wasn't teaching. This was playing games with kids, with no theoretical underpinning, with no... Um, reasoning behind how you designed your lesson. These people who had no experience teaching would design exams as they thought fit, but they'd never sat any of these exams themselves. They, they had no idea what to put in an exam and why. And that's how the, the students were assessed. And there were so many different things like this that I thought, well, this is raising a lot of alarm bells to me as a qualified teacher. Um, so they were the, the sort of more career-minded um, so you can see here, I developed a typology, um, and they were the, a lot of the career-minded people who were doing it to gain experience to get on PGC programs. Some of them weren't doing that at all. They literally just wanted to extend their gap year. They wanted to have a good time. Unfortunately, those people didn't always care about the education um, of the students. They might um, turn up late a lot, or they would turn up hungover because they were at the, par at the party the night before. Um, they wouldn't put much time or preparation into their lessons because you know, they, they just wanted the easy money and then go out afterwards. They would um, leave and not work their notice and leave school stranded with no teacher, things like this. Um, not all of them, but that, those were common traits that I would see, and they were very much leisure-minded. They weren't focused on the teaching. They were the expats. My case study initially was on Thailand. The book has taken that a bit broader and, and looked in general. But in Thailand, there's a big expat community. A lot of those are um, fairly elderly male population. So there's a huge amount of men 
who um, had relocated to Thailand and were working as TEFL teachers. They weren't necessarily bad, but a lot of the time they weren't very well qualified. Sometimes they didn't have a degree. Um, often they didn't have any English qualifications. So my argument was really, are they the best people to be un, you know, teaching this to the students? Um, and then there were the philanthropy minded people and they were really the ones who wanted to help, wanted to do good. So I've noticed there are all these different types of people and there are a lot of question marks out there for me. So I came back and I thought, this is something that, that's actually pretty serious and people aren't acknowledging this. Um, so, you know, I could see there were different tourist types. I could see there were concerns over educational standards. Um, you know, is the level of assessment correct? Are they teaching them in the best way, etc.? I could see that actually people had mixed perceptions. People, what people expected from their teaching wasn't necessarily what they were getting. It certainly wasn't what I expected. I expected it to be quite similar to here, and it really wasn't. And a lot of um, people on PGCE courses or, or employers um, or sort of university lecturers or recruitment, people who do the recruitment at universities would perceive it to be more similar to um, what we have in the UK as well. And actually it was very different. So they, what I noticed was that there's really mixed perception. Nobody really knows exactly what this is. It's not clear. And there are a lot of sustainability concerns. Is it having cultural impacts? Um, you know, is, is it economically great? A lot of the Western teachers who were 21 year olds with no English qualifications were getting paid double the salary of local teachers who were qualified, who'd been doing it many years. That's clearly going to cause some some problems in the community and some feelings of uneasiness. So I had all these things whizzing around my head. So when I came back to the UK and I decided to embark on um, a, a university level academic career, I thought, well, this is the, the area that I really want to look at. This is an important part, not only from an academic perspective, which is the way that I've portrayed it through the book, but also through an industry perspective, which is something that I'm also trying to do because um, I have my own blog and I do a lot of um, social media type stuff. So I'm also trying to put it across in that regard as well. So as a bit of a background, um, so areas of need, that are in need of investigation, what role does the TEFL, um, what role does TEFL play in the tourism industry? So it, to date, nobody had um, previously joined these two concepts. Teaching English as a foreign language and tourism were two very different things, but actually it, it, they come together very succinctly. It's very clear when you look at a lot of organisations who promote TEFL tourism, they don't call it TEFL tourism because I'm the one who's coined that term, but when they promote these trips, they look like a package holiday. They've got pictures of you know, people on the beach, people riding elephants, people you know, going to festivals on them. They, are, they, they incorporate a lot of tourism elements in them. So it's very obvious when you do you know, scour the internet for opportunities that TEFL and tourism come together very neatly, but actually, in an academic sense, those two areas haven't been joined together before. So what the book does is it looks at actually what role does TEFL play within tourism, and I focus on um, demonstrating those links and how they come together. Um, levels of regulation is something that's questioned um, and something that needs more investigation. My book really is a preliminary text to this concept. TEFL tourism hasn't been addressed before in, that manner, in this manner. So the book, what it does actually is open up lots of areas for further research, for investigation, and it asks lots of questions. Um, so one is, how can we regulate this industry? How can we make sure that you're, you know, the person who's teaching them is not a paedophile? Because there, there are no checks in most cases to check that it isn't the case. How can we check that they're suitably qualified? Because there are many people teaching who don't have qualifications, who don't have backgrounds, who haven't got adequate experience teaching. Those sorts of things. So regulation is in need. What are the impacts of commodification? So very much so, the TEFL industry has been commodified. It, it's no longer about, in many cases, about development needs, about helping people. Um, it's about you know, selling a product. And there are many companies who've packaged this and they sell it just like they would sell you a package holiday. You know, what, what are the implications of that? Um, is the TEFL package a representation of postmodern tourism? Well, I, I argue that, that it absolutely is. 
You know, it might not be your traditional transfer flight and hotel, but it is, very, it is definitely replicable of that. Um, and the TEFL package, so to speak, will often include um, maybe not the flight, but transfers, um, sometimes flights, it depends on the organisation. Um, they'll often include some form of qualification and some form of accommodation, and then there might be extras. And you purchase it just in the way that you would a, a traditional package holiday. And actually, companies like Eye to Eye, who are, who are owned by TUI, are very big on TEFL tourism. So a lot of the companies that you see selling this are, are aligned with the traditional mass tourism model. So there's definitely some um, relationship there that, that could do with further exploration. What's the role of pedagogy in teaching philosophies and principles? So what role does a the actual practice of teaching play in TEFL tourism? Um, from my research, I've seen not a huge role. So perhaps that's where the regulation needs to come in. What's the impact of ethnocentric perceptions? So I've got a section in the book where I talk about the fact that our perceptions derive from our own personal experiences. It's inevitable that if I go out to another country and I'm told to teach something, or if one of you are, you're going to do that in a way that you've learned from your own experience in education, whether you've taught or whether you've been taught. You've seen how a teacher was when you've sat in a classroom. That's how you think teaching should take place. And that's not always appropriate in other contexts, particularly when we've got geographical and cultural differences. So, you know, what role does that play and how does that impact? Is it enhancing issues such as globalisation and, and power inequalities and things like this? And, and they're, they're very much sustainability issues that need to be considered. Um, as I've discussed, are the TEFL teachers suitably qualified? What role does it actually play in development? Does it help development? Perhaps not. In many cases, you might have TEFL tourists who are on short-term um, placements. How much good are they doing when they're only there for a week or two weeks? Is the next TEFL tourist just teaching them the same things all over again? Are they actually working from a proper curriculum? Often not. So how much are the students learning? Is it really helping countries to meet their development agendas? Um, what are the sustainable, ethical, negative impacts? So I've touched on some of those. Um, who are these TEFL tourists? How can we best tailor these, these products to them? How can we best manage it? And looking at the wider tourism industry, what lessons can we learn? There's been lots and lots of studies of particularly um, positive and negative impacts of different tourism forms. We can take lessons from those and apply them to the context of TEFL tourism. We don't need to make the same mistakes again. So these are some areas that are in need of investigation that I highlight throughout the book um, and, and that you know, I, I really have asked a lot of questions and, and I think there's scope for lots more research to take place there. Um, so just to give you um, a quick run through of some of the main areas addressed in the book then. Um, so what is TEFL tourism? Um, so that it's rooted in both the concepts of te teaching English as a foreign language and of tourism. Um, a TEFL tourism can be classified as a tourist on two grounds. Firstly, they travel away from the home country for a period of time. And secondly, once they're there, they then travel around or go on day trips, etc. in their destination. Um, they can often be qualified as educational tourists as well. They are um, generally educated as part of the experience, whether they gain a formal TEFL qualification or whether they're just learning about the new culture, about the new destination, about teaching practices. Um, and they're also the educators. So educational tourism has been looked at in that first regard quite, quite a bit, but it hasn't been looked at in this second regard, where actually the tourists are the people doing the educating, not taking it. So that's another interesting take on TEFL tourism that hasn't been explored yet that I introduce in the book. So my definition um, that I've put down in the book that I derived from my PhD research is that a TEFL tourist is a person who travels outside of their usual environment to teach English as a foreign language whose role shifts between tourist, educator and educatee at various points in their trip. So TEFL tourism is not straightforward 
And this is part of the, the wider problem. You know, it, it spans different countries, different cultures, um, different ethnicities, and this brings with it lots of um, you know, complications. Um, you know, there, there's lots of things to consider, such as the, the issue of globalisation, what impact does that pet take, um, developing economies and the differences between those and developed economies. Um, we've got the growing need for English teachers, and this is one way to meet that demand. Is it the most appropriate way? Maybe not, but if it's the only way, should, should destinations do this? I think that we need to do a lot more research behind um, you know, the motivations and the impacts in order to establish um, that. Regulation, as I've said, is a, is a big concern, and there are differences across education systems as well. In some countries, um, education systems are very open. In others, they're very closed. So in, in Western culture, we tend to encourage open thinking. In many countries, it's very much rote learning. Some countries, they have very strict punishment. Maybe they have physical punishment, whereas in many Western, or all Western countries, that's not something that's acceptable within our culture. So these differences need to be overcome and need to be managed, or, or an awareness at the very least needs to be um, highlighted for these. So that's just to give you a few examples of why it's quite a complicated um, issue to examine. To give you an idea of how big it is and why um, I obviously thought that there was the need to do the research in this area, um, we've got a world of increasing globalisation. More and more people want to speak English. Um, English is increasingly becoming the spoken language in lots of places. Um, and because of this, we need lots of people to teach it. Um, so as of 2014, which was the latest statistic I've been able to get, um, the number of English language learners worldwide peaked at 1.5 billion, um, with estimates that this figure will increase to over 2 billion by 2020. So it's just to put it into perspective, you know, it's big business. It's estimated that over 250,000 native English speakers work as English teachers, although we don't know exactly because there is a lot of informal employment as well that isn't necessarily accounted for. Um, that takes place in over 40,000 different schools and language institutes around the world. Um, so that's just to give you an idea, demonstrate that it is a big industry. In many ways, this industry has now been commodified. We, we've turned it into a product. Um, and this is due to our you know, ever capitalist market. Um, and a lot of organisations are really taking advantage of the opportunity to make money from this as a business. So the, the initial um, premise of meeting development needs, of giving aid, of helping communities, maybe isn't so much in the forefront as it used to be. Um, because we've now had all these profit oriented organisations that have really come into the marketplace. Um, so essentially language is now treated as an economic resource. Um, which is cultivated for material profit or acquired as a skill to be offered on the market. Um, and the TEFL process has, has been organised, it's been reshaped and it's been put often into this package format um, because it, it, it's now become a business more than just a, a, something to do good and to help. Um, so in the book I look at the relationship between tourism um, development and language and the tourism industry inherently is very profit driven um, whereas the development industry is the paradox to that so actually does it work um, we don't really know because not enough studies have been done on it and um, but this is something that I discuss in the book and um, there's a lot of ambiguities in the industry and a lot of questions and, and like I said Throughout the book, I do raise lots and lots of different questions about um, TEFL tourism and, and highlight areas that do need more research. Um, what makes a good teacher? Well, a good teacher in England might not be a good teacher in India or Costa Rica or you know, Tanzania. So that, that's quite ambiguous. What are the cultural impacts of this? Inevitably, if I'm teaching English, I'm going to use my own colloquial phrases. I'm going to give my own examples. I might talk about pop culture. 
that they that that destination the people in that destination that culture might not be familiar with those i might offend them by saying something that they find offensive because i'm ignorant i'm naive i don't realize and there are lots of examples of this so the cultural aspects definitely need a lot more investigation am i contributing to globalization is that necessarily a bad thing you know this this is another area what is a TEFL qualification? Well, I, I highlighted that um, at the beginning. You know, there are qualifications you can do at university that last a year. There are other qualifications you can do online that last 20 hours. On paper, they both say TEFL certificate. This is something that I, I definitely think needs regulation, but it's very um, blurred. What actually is a, a TEFL qualification? We don't really know. Um, so that leads me on to lack of regulation. There's very little regulation saying who can be employed, who can't. There's very few background checks. There's very few checks on what qualifications you've got, what work experience you should have. And where there are regulations, it's certainly not on a global scale or any, t any sort of international scale. It, it's on a local scale where that does apply. That's something that needs to be addressed. Lack of transparency. Do prospective TEFL tourists really know what, what, they, what they're going to do? Do they really know what the job entails? In my research, the answer to that was often no. People, I, I found that people ended up teaching the police. They had no idea they were doing that. They had to take part in um, school shows and dress up and they, they felt really silly because they did their hair and makeup in a way that they would never normally leave the house. Well, they didn't know the job involved that. And for some people, you know, that, that might be a deal breaker. They might decide to resign over things like that. It's not transparent at all. Those people then apply to a university PGCE placement who also don't know that that was their job role. They think they were working with exam bodies. They think they were working, you know, incorporating these concepts I mentioned at the beginning, differentiation, different pe teaching pedagogy. They don't realise that they don't know any of this essential underpinning knowledge or that we view to be essential here so there's there's definitely a lack of transparency and how do we measure quality there's no Ofsted you know there, there's there's very little measurement of quality across the board so TEFL tourism links with lots of different tourism forms um, I've identified that there's the, the macro niche forms of tourism such as volunteer tourism, philanthropic tourism, cultural, pro-poor, educational, adventure, gap year. Often these are inherently linked with TEFL tourism. So you might be on a gap year and during that time you're doing TEFL teaching. You might be um, out to learn about teaching practice, so you're an educational tourist whilst you're teaching English. So a lot of those are inherently linked with the practice of TEFL tourism. We then also have some micro niches um, such as TEFL, uh, linguistic tourism, so when you're, perhaps there's people out there to learn the local language, and service learning as well. So there is existing research in these other areas within these, these niches. So what I'm arguing is that it, it, why aren't we taking lessons from them? At the moment, we don't see, there doesn't seem to be very good management or, or very much management taking place. Um, on a, a large scale, perhaps there is on smaller scales, um, but there's little evidence of this. And there's lots and lots of research within the wider tourism industry that we can take, we can apply, and we can learn lessons so that we don't make the same mistakes again. We then have um, different types of TEFL agencies, which I address in the book as well. So we have two major strands. So there's the teaching focus type agencies. So they tend to be our non-governmental agencies, our charities, development organisations, government organisations. Um, we then have our tourism focused. So they're the ones who are um, often through a tour operator. Perhaps they are a subsidiary of a big tour operator, such as Eye to Eye is a subsidiary of TUI. Um, and you've got your teaching agencies there as well. So some are for profit, some are not for profit that's inevitably going to have an impact on their motivations and the way that they operate. So the TEFL package is something that I introduced briefly earlier. 
Tefl tourism is a micro niche, but it does demonstrate really strong links or, or really strong similarities with um, mass market. So you've got um, this, this package model, essentially. Um, so, like I said before, you've got lots of elements that will basically be incorporated into a package. You can literally go on the website, click purchase, and the next thing you know, you're off on your way to be a TEFL teacher. So there are definitely similarities there. Um, and I suggest that we do need more research into what are the implications of that. Um, Organisations who want to make a profit and who put together such TEFL packages aren't necessarily vetting people to get the best people. They are profit orientated most of the time. So, you know, does prof the profit orientated market necessarily align itself well with something that ultimately is supposed to um, enhance development and give aid to a community. Often those things don't sit so well together. So that's definitely somewhere that, um, something that needs additional exploration. Um, there's also questions about education, as I touched on before as well. Um, you know, what is good education? What is a good teacher? Should we necessarily take our teaching practices from the UK or whatever Western country we're from? and just apply them in a developing country. Um, there are arguments to suggest that that might not always be appropriate. That might, that could be culturally insensitive. Um, it might be inappropriate. They might not understand. They might not react well to our practices. And actually there's an argument to say that we should be looking more at their needs rather than just giving them what we already know. Um, so that's something that, that I address in the book, and I've got a, a chapter that looks at the, the issue of education and the differences between different educational systems. Um, one of the major issues that I also highlight in the book is um, impacts. So inevitably, any tourism form has both positive and negative impacts. Um, so TEFL tourism is no different. Like I said, we can align a lot of these with other tourism forms and we can learn lessons from them. And I think it's very important that we do. Um, so I, I won't talk you through all of these um, here, but there's just some examples for you of the types of impacts that we could be identified within the social, economic and pedagogic realms, um, which are obviously areas that, that are very important. So I talk about that more in the book. Um, I also look at who are TEFL tourists. So in order to manage um, the industry, we need to understand who are these people who, that are involved. Um, so uh, this is according to my case study, and obviously wider research is needed in different destinations. Um, but I've given a sort of brief introduction to this in the book um, and, and highlighted that it is, it is an area that requires more research. Um, just to give you an idea from my case study, um, most people did not have prior teaching experience, less than half. Um, most TEFL tourists don't teach as part of a gap year. Um, the most common length of a TEFL, TEFL placement is between one and two years. The average salary is about £700. That was in Thailand. That will differ greatly between destinations. Um, lots of TEFL tourists are also entitled to expenses and they might get free accommodation, housing allowances, free food, travel reimbursements, visas, work permits, etc. And um, for those who do pay an agency, often a, a package type um, agency, the average amount is about £550. And again, that was for a, um, based on Thailand. They tend to be older than volunteer tourists. I've, do, I've done lots of comparisons between TEFL tourism and volunteer tourism because I identified volunteer tourism as being the, the most similar tourism form. Um, so they, they tend to be um, between the ages of 22 to 30. Most of them are single. Um, there are five dominant nationalities, which is British, American, South African, Irish and Australian. But most organisations do have criteria for which nationality you need to be. So that's very much dictated by that. Um, most TEFL tourists are qualified to degree level above. 
and um, there are wide concerns about whether they hold the right skills. Are they suitably qualified? Do they have suitable skills to actually be a TEFL teacher? So that's just to give you an idea of the characteristics. Um, I, within my research, I've identified that there are lots of differences between Western teaching and teaching in developing countries, which are things that should be addressed in the TEFL qualifications that don't tend to be. Things such as physical punishment, um, lack of pedagogic understanding, um, lack of formal assessments, lack of curriculum, cultural differences, um, etc. Um, so I think an important question to ask is what is the focus? Is it teaching or is it tourism? And that really differs depending on the, the TEFL tourist. Often actually some of them will move. Their focus is teaching Monday to Friday but on the weekend they let the hair down and all bets are off. Um, that, that's quite common, which is why I, I, in my definition I say that TEFL tourists um, can move between being the educator, the educatee at various points of their trip. Um, so there's just a couple of quotes for you um, to give you an idea of the sorts of things people are saying. Um, so as I, as I outlined at the beginning, I have developed a typology based on Thailand. Um, so I've given that as an example in the book, but obviously the book has widened it out. It's not only looking at Thailand. Um, but I think that the, these four categories do um, summarise quite well the different types of people. And I, I'd be very interested to see studies undertaken in similar destinations or, or totally different destinations, in fact, to see if this does still work um, across... Um, different areas. Um, so like I said, that just summarises um, the fact that they do change their roles. So they might be tourist on the weekend, teacher in the week, and that's very common. Give you an idea of motivations and um, lots of reasons people want to be TEFL teachers. Here's just a list of some of the major motivations. Like I said at the beginning, um, their motivations generally do centre around what type of TEFL tourist they are. So if they're a career-minded tourist, their major motivations will be around probably building their CV, gaining experience, that sort of stuff. If they are leisure-minded, their major motivations will be around um, leisure activities, going to the beach, um, the weather being nice, things like that probably. So what I really highlight in the book is I introduce all of these different areas and all of these concepts um, but I really, I really highlight that actually we need to understand this industry more and we can't do that through one book. There is a, an urgent need, I would argue, for more research, for more understanding, um, it, for many reasons. Um, to enable agencies to sufficiently understand the motivations and requirements of their clients, um, which will enhance their business potential. So, for example, if you are one of those organisations selling the TEFL packages, if you don't know who you're selling it to, you're, you're not probably going to be doing your best job. You need to understand that. So that's important. Um, to provide prospective tourists with an accurate perception of the TEFL experience. If they don't understand what they're buying into, they might not last. They might not be happy. They might not give good reviews. They might cause problems in the destination through their behaviour because they're not enjoying it, they're not happy with it. So we need to be more transparent. To enable future employers such as schools, such as university placements, um, to actually understand what is the experience and to, you know, to, to plan accordingly. To enable educational institutions um, also to be able to, to understand, to be able to plan accordingly um, and to understand you know, what skill set people are going to come to them with if they've been a TEFL teacher. Are there expectations? realistic. But also for the government, ultimately TEFL tourism should be about enhancing the levels of English in the community. And that's often a top-down process um, or initiated as a top-down process by the government. Um, so the government needs to have an understanding of is it working? Is it causing more positive benefits than negative benefits? And that we don't know yet because there hasn't been enough research into it. So these are all some of the, the, the major areas highlighting why we really need to understand this industry more and sort of underpinning the rationale for writing the book.